One week ago, right now, one week ago, I was in the Central American country of Belize with my daughter, riding horses through what she called the for real jungle on our way to Mayan ruins where we climbed pyramids that reminded me of my fear of heights. And we, we ziplined through the canopy of rainforests and we swam snorkeling the second largest barrier reef in the world. And in the immortal words of Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, I thought I was going to die. I'm not sure I am fully recovered, but came back and had to dive right into this morning's message and get prepared for that. I read our text and I thought, too much. And uh, so we're, we're just going to limit ourselves to those first five verses. There's enough there. We're going to ditch the title of the message. It had to do with what came at the end of that reading. We may come up with a new title as we go along. I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure where we're going here this morning. Sometimes <laughs> preaching can be like that. Billy Graham was fond of observing. Um, one time he went to preach at a revival in a South Carolina town. He showed up uh, on the day before the evening service. He had a letter he had to mail, and he ran into a young lad and asked for directions to the post office to mail his letter, and the boy told him the directions he needed. And he said, young man, if you come to First Baptist Church tonight, I'll tell you how to get to heaven. The boy said, no thanks, you don't even know how to get to the post office. <laughs> Sometimes... We can have experience, we can have eloquence, we can be popular preachers. It doesn't always mean we're going to be effective uh, with everyone. And what's even probably worse are preachers who uh, maybe are eloquent and, and, uh, and known for their uh, being wordsmiths and what a good expositors of the Bible, but who do not practice what they preach. There was an article in the news this past week, you may have read about it, about a pastor who was caught in a compromising situation with a parishioner's wife. And uh, the, the parishioner came home unexpectedly and was uh, not happy with what he found, went back to his gun truck to procure a gun, and the pastor ran down the street without a stitch of clothing on. I don't know if you saw this or not. I was, I had to watch the video of this guy. It was, uh, no, I mean, not the running down the street part. He was in church and somebody clandestinely recorded his explaining this to the congregation. And it was entertaining, not particularly edifying. Better to practice what we preach and not preach so well than the other way around. This was the approach Paul took in our text for this morning, writing to a church in Corinth that he helped to gather. He reminds them, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Now, Paul was the foremost church planter in the early church. No one could compare with him and his effectiveness at that task. But he wasn't, by his own admission, a particularly good preacher. And we don't have any recordings of his sermons, but we do have his writings. And if his writings are any clue about his preaching, he had a tendency toward run-on sentences. For example, in his letter to the Ephesians, there's a brief greeting at the beginning. And then in the King James Version, what follows is a sentence that runs to 240 words. Now, by comparison, the shortest sentence in the Bible is, is two words, Jesus wept. 240 words, and the next sentence after it runs to 167 words. Now, if he preached at all like he wrote, you have to wonder, when did the guy come up for air in, in his uh, 
in this uh, rambling, convoluted uh, style of his. Well, it's obvious from our text that he knew this about himself, but he also knew some other things about himself. He knew that he was called by God to preach. He knew that God would give him the words to say, and he knew that God would make him effective at what he was being called to do as long as he denied himself, took up his cross, and followed the master. He continues, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. If you think Jesus was sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night when he was betrayed, Paul says, well, check me out before I start preaching. His legs buckled under him. His hands were weak. His lips trembled. He had a great fear of standing up and proclaiming the gospel. But you have to say this about Paul. He dared to go where angels fear to tread. He spoke truth to power, even though he knew he was going to get a beating at the the best, and maybe a stoning at the worst, both of which happened to him. He spoke when he was forbidden to speak, even though he knew he would be run out of town at the best or imprisoned at the worst. And over and over again, he was persecuted terribly for proclaiming the gospel um, at every opportunity, even to jailhouse guards he would proclaim the gospel. This is what Paul did well. He persevered. He did that very well. He might be terrified to preach the gospel, but he got up and he did it. And despite the great persecutions, he continued to preach the gospel. He even wrote letters while he was in prison to churches that he was in prison for helping to found because they were illegal. And he did it with an undimmed joy and uh, a transcendent peace. I have a theory. There's nothing in the Bible about this. I think he thought he had it coming. He had persecuted the church, and he just thought that he, he deserved to be persecuted for furthering the gospel. I don't know, but I'll tell you this. He would do it rejoicing. He would be beaten down, and he'd come right back up and be just as enthusiastic as he was before. And this is what he did well. And it was an attractive thing about him because there were people in his world whose joy was diminished by a constant barrage of a stressful life. Things would come up. Their peace was disturbed. Nobody likes to be like that. And they thought, I'd like to have what that guy has. And they were drawn to the gospel. And they were drawn to him and the way he embodied the gospel in his life. He said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on man's wisdom, but on God's power. Paul was a demonstrator in the best sense of the word, not so much a pontificator. And people saw him. He was visibly trembling and nervous, but he'd get up and preach. And they watched him suffer these persecutions and go right back and get in the saddle and do it again. He was beloved by growing numbers of believers because of what he demonstrated in his life. Not so much for what he said and how he said it, but for how he demonstrated it. I'm reminded of a poem by Edward Guest entitled, I'd Rather See a Sermon. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but examples always clear. And the best of all preachers are the ones who live their creeds, 
For to see good put in action is what everybody needs. I soon can learn to do it if you'll let me see it done. I can watch your hands in action, but your tongue too fast may run. And the lecture you deliver may be very wise and true, but I'd rather get my lessons by observing what you do. For I might misunderstand you in the high advice you give, but there's no misunderstanding how you act and how you live. I have known of this poem for a long time. I've always thought of my colleague, Reverend Orak, when I read this. When my mom and dad came, well, you don't know this. When I was a candidate for the ministry here, mom and dad came to scope out the promised land. Came up from Columbus, didn't tell anybody. Went around, thought it was a beautiful church. And then decided to stick their head inside and, uh, and poke around a little bit. And Reverend Horak saw them, didn't know who they were, came out to ask them how they were doing and if they, if they needed anything. Now, my mother, <laughs> she, she had a, ta- a knack of sizing people up. She could do it the first couple seconds. She met a person. My brother once said, have you ever noticed how right mom is about negative things? I mean, she would meet people, she would meet people, and right then and there turn around and go, he's an odd bird. And you'd go, Mom, you, you just met the... But then time would go on, and he was an odd bird. And my brother would go, do you ever notice how that works? But she was also pretty adept at, at positive things. She just remembered the other ones better. She sized, she sized Reverend Horak up quite simply. She said, we met the associate pastor. He's a nice man, Bill. Now, that may not sound like much of a commendation to you, but believe me, from my mother, without any addendum, that was saying something. And he is a nice guy. And you all love him because he's a nice guy. As a pastor on your staff, I wish you liked him and loved me. But (laughs) I don't even get too worried about it anymore because I love him too. And, and uh, I, I've, always, I've always thought about him about that. He demonstrates, embodies the gospel. Now, you may be asking yourself, what, what this, this uh, you know, Reverend Horak and St. Paul and Billy Graham, preachers all, what does that have to do with me? I never went to seminary. I, I've never stood up in a pulpit to preach or on a street corner. I'm not sure... I'm built for for doing that. St. Peter referred to all of us in one of his letters as a royal priesthood. And John echoed that in the book of Revelation where he said, we're all priests, pastors, you know, we're all ministers. We're all called to proclaim the gospel. And uh, Paul himself wrote to the Philippians, In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And he encourages them to stand firm, contending as one person for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. And... And it wasn't just the preachers and the apostles who suffered. It wasn't just Paul who paid a price for his faith. All the believers were called to do that. All of them were called to embody the gospel. And the world is not always friendly toward people who do that. So we're all called to be walking witnesses, living testimonies of the gospel. St. Francis of Assisi was known to say, Preach the good news at all times. If necessary, use words. <laughs> it's not always necessary to use words. Most of the time, it is not. And we may not feel called to go on the pre- street corner and preach, but, but we are called to be living testimonies, living witnesses. There are eyes watching us. As we go forth into the coming week, that thought should condition us. How might we live differently the balance of this day and tomorrow, knowing that we are to be embodiments 
of the gospel of, of Jesus. Eyes are watching us. We don't know if there are little children, if there are spouses, if there are friends, our church family, our neighbors. There are eyes watching us. Are we going to be those who practice what we preach, or are we going to be like, like that fellow running down the street without a stitch of clothing on that was in the news this past week? What are they going to find in us? About seven months ago, I'm going to conclude with this. I preached a sermon entitled The Gospel According to You. There was a poem in it. There are just two stanzas of that that I think bear repeating as a fitting a finish for our message. You are writing each moment a letter to all. Take care that the writing is true. It's the only gospel some people will read, the gospel according to you. You are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the deeds that you do, by the words that you say. Others read what you write and they watch carefully too. Say, what is the gospel according to you? Please rise.